Many years ago, in the small German city of Cologne, there lived a very proud and very large candy maker named August. August considered himself to be the greatest candy maker in the entire city, probably in the entire country, and perhaps in the whole world. And in that he may have been right. But no one could be sure, for as I have said, August was a very proud man and he did not believe that just anybody should be allowed to taste his scrumptious sweets. Every day he would display his wonderful treats in the window of his shop, and every day the children of Cologne would gather outside to gaze in at the marvelous candies, to smell the sweet sugary smells that poured out of August's chimney. Shoo, August would say, quit your drooling at my window, you block the view for the good paying customers and he would chase the children away from his shop. Then he would sweep his front stoop and polish the large pane of glass in hopes that a noble man or woman would stroll by and want to purchase his tasty wares. But when the rich folks in town did pass by, they saw that there were no children at August's shop and assumed that his candy must not be good. They would never even give his wonderful candies a second look. August hardly seemed to notice. He would just go about his work as usual, cleaning and baking and cooking and stacking and making fabulous treats that no one but himself would enjoy. One day, as August was arranging his candies beneath a great glass counter, the door of his shop swung open, an icy wind swept through August's tiny shop, sending a chill through his proud red cheeks. A visitor, August thought. Why, this must be the busiest day all year. And in stomped the king's own messenger, shaking the snow from his large leather boots. He was a mountain of a man, and when he spoke, the glass jars on August's shelves shook as if in fear. Greetings, candy maker, the man said. Oh, greetings, good sir, August bowed oddly. Welcome to my shop. Have you come to purchase some of my fine candy? Certainly not, the messenger snapped. I have come with a message from his royal majesty. Oh, the king, August cheered. Of course, who else but the king himself would want to send me a message? This proclamation is not just for you, candy maker, the messenger barked. The king has decreed that all shop owners and craftsmen in the city must bring a present to the royal palace on Christmas Eve. The present will be given to the king's son, Prince James. Only the finest of gifts will be acceptable, of course. Of course, said the candy maker, and his face beamed with pride. Only the finest will be acceptable. I can assure you that the king will not be disappointed. I should hope not, candy maker, the messenger replied. Good day to you. And a good day to you, sir, the candy maker answered. But the messenger was already back outside. The door to August's shop closed with a slam. August danced about his little shop. A Christmas present for Prince James, he sang. What a wonderful chance to show the king my fabulous candy. The finest in the land, I'm sure. I must get right to work. Christmas Eve is only a week away. He locked up his shop and hung a sign on the door. Making candy for the king, it read. We'll open after Christmas. I'm sure my customers will understand, August beamed. For the king, only the finest gifts will be acceptable. He started to work right away on a new candy treat. But what should it be? Chocolates? No, he thought, much too messy. Caramels? Uh, too sticky. Taffy? Uh, too stretchy. Marshmallows? Good heavens, no! Something hard and sweet and clean and minty and pure. Yes, that would be perfect. He chose the freshest ingredients, the sweetest sugar, the mintiest mint, the best of everything, and he went to work. 
the next week the doors of the shop remained closed and no one saw august go in or out even the children whom august had so often chased away from his shop could see nothing of the candy maker through his front window he had devoted all of his time to making his candy but that did not bother August after all, he would say to himself as he stirred and mixed in his kitchen. Only the finest gifts will be acceptable. By the time the week was over, August had created hundreds of types of treats. Butterscotch balls and cinnamon swirls, lemony lollipops and grapeity gumdrops. Each one better than the one before and every one more delicious than any candy any child had ever eaten. But still, August was not satisfied. He kept working day and night, testing and tasting and baking and basting, until finally he was happy. It was the day before Christmas, the last day to prepare, and August had created a practically perfect candy. A straight peppermint stick of pure sugar, striped with royal red in honor of the king, and not just one, but a whole basketful. Surely there could be no better present for young Prince James. This is it, laughed August, brimming with pride. But still, something is missing. The candy maker thought. Then he had a most brilliant idea, if he did say so himself. He bent the end of the peppermint stick around his hand and formed the letter J. J for James, he said. Only the finest will be acceptable. When Christmas Eve finally arrived, no one in Cologne was happier than August. At last, he said, my candy will be eaten by the king, just as it should be. He packed up his candy J's and put on his finest candy-making uniform. Then he locked up his tiny shop and set out through the snow in the direction of the royal palace. As he trudged up the streets of Cologne through the drifting snow, August whistled and hummed out loud. He was bursting with pride from the top of his red-pointed cap to the tip of his warm woolen boots. His red cheeks seemed to glow in the chilly winter air, and soon his modest whistle became a booming song. Oh, the grandest candy maker in the land is what they'll say When they taste my dandy candy on this grandest Christmas day And there can be no mistaking through the land of Germany That the candy maker making dandy candy can be me As I always have suspected, fame and fortune will be mine If the finest are accepted, I'm the finest of the fine From the butcher to the baker, you will hear the people sing Of the grandest candy maker, making candy for the king Just then, a cold blast of winter air hit August full in the face My, my, thought August, perhaps I have not dressed for the weather and it was true, August had been so busy with his candy making, he had not noticed the dropping temperature and the wind blowing wildly, whipping through the city of Cologne. The royal palace is still many blocks away, but it is much too late to turn back. I must deliver my candy tonight. Only the finest will be acceptable, August thought. He warmed himself with proud thoughts. Thoughts about the king and Prince James. Thoughts about his fabulous candy and thoughts about the fame and fortune that awaited him at the palace. And he continued through the wintry streets of Cologne. At last, August came to the large square in front of the Cologne Cathedral. He was now at the center of town with only a few blocks to go. Out here in the open, the winds blew even more wildly and cold, so August moved closer to the cathedral, trying to stay out of the strongest breezes. Above the wind, August could hear the low humming of the cathedral's organ. On a calmer night, August would have heard the organ as far away as his shop, but tonight he was almost at the cathedral before the low notes thrummed in his ears. August had all but forgotten that it was Christmas Eve. 
For just a moment, he wondered why the cathedral organ was playing so late on such a snowy night. Oh, of course, said August, looking up at the cathedral's tall spires. The Christmas services. I'd almost forgot. In the middle of his thought, August suddenly tripped. He had not been looking where he was going, and his foot had bumped into something, and that something said, Ouch! August turned and twisted and did an odd dance in the snow, trying with all his might not to fall and smash his minty sticks. Only the finest will be acceptable, he shouted as he spun out of control. And with that, August landed flat on his belly. Kerflop! As he opened his eyes, August saw a fuzzy figure standing in front of him. It was a little boy, dressed in a simple brown robe and wearing a strange white headdress. Sir, are you all right? The boy chattered. My candy, August shouted. I've ruined my candy. No, sir, the boy replied. It landed softly in the snow. Oh, thank goodness, he sighed as he dragged himself to his feet. It's for the king, you know, and only the finest will be accepted. It looks wonderful, the boy replied as August gathered the basket back into his arms. Well, of course it does, snapped August. I made it for the king, after all. Your candy always looks wonderful, he shivered again. It was only then that August took a good look at the tiny boy whom he had tripped over. For that is what had happened, and that is why August had fallen in the first place. But August did not look at the boy in anger, no, quite the opposite. For the first time in his life, August looked upon the child with compassion. Why, you look as though you've been sitting out in the snow for hours in only that thin robe, August wondered at the child. We have to get you into the cathedral before you freeze. No, sir, I, I can't go in there, he shivered. I am supposed to be a shepherd in the manger scene, but I have forgotten my shepherd's staff. I have nothing to bring before the baby Jesus. August now saw how the child's face was streaked with tears. He thought of the many children he had chased away from his shop, the happy children he sent away crying. Here, said August handing one of his candy canes to the child, a shepherd's staff just the size for the baby Jesus. And it's sure to be the finest one. Only the finest will be acceptable. The boy's face lit up in a beautiful smile, and he threw his arms around August's neck. It's wonderful, he cheered, the most wonderful shepherd's staff ever. And the tastiest, too, no doubt, August laughed. Now get inside before you shiver away to nothing. August followed the boy through the grand wooden doors of the cathedral. There they were greeted by the warmth and glow of soft candlelight, which seemed to fill the church with the light of a thousand stars. The boy left August standing at the back of the cathedral and calmly walked the long aisle to take his place with the other children in the manger scene. As August stood staring, someone bumped into him from behind. Oof! August heard. Once again, his first reaction was to steady his basket full of candy, but he quickly turned around to see who was making the commotion. Pardon me, sir, said the strange little man. I wasn't looking where I was going. My mind is just a bit preoccupied, you know. Such a terrible inconvenience, and at such a terrible time. Whatever will I do? Whatever will I do? August, not wanting to disturb the church service, quickly leaned down and helped the skinny man to his feet. No trouble at all, sir, August whispered. Are you all right? All right, the man snapped as he straightened up. Of course I'm not all right. Things couldn't be more wrong, and at such a terrible time. Well, you don't look hurt, August said softly. What's wrong? Can I be of any help? August had all but forgotten his rush to the royal palace. I can't imagine how you could, the man replied, unless you are very good at quieting children. I have an entire balcony filled with children. And as you can tell by the noise, I cannot keep them quiet during the service. August now recognized the man. This was the cathedral's choir director. 
August had seen him many times at church before, but only up in the balcony. Oh, I see, said August, uh, just a bit too loudly. You're having trouble with the children's choir. Isn't that what I just said? The man snapped back. Then realizing his harsh tone, he apologized. I'm sorry, sir. I just don't know what to do. During most services, I give the children something sweet to keep them quiet between songs. But in my hurried preparations for Christmas, I completely forgot. It's not your trouble, sir. Please have a seat and join the service, and don't be bothered by the noisy children. The choir director turned to climb the balcony stairs. Wait, called August from behind him. The man turned around. How many children do you have? Why, fifty at least, the choir director replied. But what can you do? The shops are all closed. It's Christmas Eve. Fifty children, eh, said August with a smile. Fifty children without a suite for Christmas? I think that maybe I can help after all. And he handed the basket of candy canes to the choir director. Here, August said, only the finest will be acceptable. The choir director's smile stretched ear to ear. He couldn't help tasting one of the candies for himself. Why, they are wonderful, he sighed. The children will be thrilled. Though he had spent many years making and tasting his own candy, this was the first compliment that August had ever heard. He was so overwhelmed with joy he could barely think of what to say. I, I shaped them into a J, August stammered. I shaped them into a J for, for Jesus, the choir director interjected. Yes, said August without thinking. Shaped like a J for the baby Jesus. He turned to look up the aisle to see his tiny friend, the shepherd. For Jesus, he repeated. Only the finest will be acceptable. Somewhere behind August, the choir director danced up the stairs to the balcony, but August barely heard the thank you, sir, that echoed down the staircase. He was so filled with true happiness that he just stood and stared. August must have stood there for quite some time, too, for he barely took notice of the commotion that was building its way through their congregation. Somehow, August's basket of candy canes had made its way back down from the balcony and was being passed throughout the cathedral. It's delicious, someone in the back of the church whispered. Sweet and pure, a man replied a few rows up. Pure, like the pure heart of Jesus. And striped with red, a third person announced. Red, for the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus that makes our hearts pure too. And it's shaped like a J, another woman said in a near shout. What a perfect reminder of the baby Jesus. The conversation grew louder and louder as the candy canes were shared among the worshippers. Finally, as the mumblings became quite loud, a grand figure stood up in the front of the cathedral. Silence, the voice rumbled. The sound broke August's trance, for it was, of course, the voice of the king. In all my years of ruling, I have never heard such a disturbance in the cathedral, the king stated. And on Christmas Eve, what could be the cause of such noise, he demanded to know. But the king's announcement had silenced the congregation. Well, he repeated, who can explain this disturbance? From beside the king, a small voice broke the silence. Perhaps I can explain, Father, the voice said. August immediately recognized the voice as that of his little friend, the shepherd. Prince James, August gasped with disbelief, for that is who the little shepherd was. James, the king asked, you know why the people are making so much noise? Yes, Father, Prince James explained. It's because of my candy shepherd's staff, the one I brought to Jesus and he handed the striped candy to the king. My, my, said the king, that is quite a shepherd's staff, the perfect shepherd's staff for Jesus, our good shepherd. Just then someone spoke up. Look, she said, Prince James has one of the Jesus reminders too. 
And with that, the congregation started their jabbering again. Silence! The king's voice boomed once more. Who is responsible for these Christmas reminders? Who gave Prince James this candy shepherd staff? Answer, by order of the king. August stood absolutely still in the back of the cathedral. He could not move. He could not speak. The king himself was holding a piece of his candy, as August had always dreamed, but August could not say a word. There he is, father, Prince James cheered. There he is at the back of the church. That's the man who gave me the shepherd's staff. August felt his face go flush. He took a step backward, but was stopped by a large body. The king's messenger had quickly blocked August's way to the door. It's the candy maker, sire, the messenger shouted to the king. Come forward, candy maker, the king commanded. August's heart was pounding and sweat started to bead on his forehead. Just an hour earlier, August could not wait to show the king his candy, but now he wanted nothing more than to slink back out into the snow. You heard the king, the messenger said gruffly in his ear. Now get moving. August slowly walked up the aisle. Every eye in the cathedral was turned on the candy maker, but August did not notice. He could not take his eyes off the smiling face of Prince James. Prince James, who had dressed as a lowly shepherd for the church manger scene, Prince James, who had shivered in the cold without a gift for the baby Jesus. Prince James, who so appreciated August's simple act of kindness. August now stood before the king. Is this true, candy maker? The king asked. Did you make this shepherd's staff? Did you make this tiny reminder of Jesus' birth? August simply nodded. Well, I must say, candy maker, I am a bit disappointed, the king said. Yes, sire, August said quite humbly. Yes, I am disappointed, the king repeated. And then he smiled. Disappointed that I did not bring such a fine gift for the people in the cathedral. Such a fine gift to lay before the baby Jesus. You have reminded me and the people here that the finest gift of Christmas is God's gift of Jesus. August heard Prince James giggle. Only the finest would be acceptable, Father. Well said, son, the king laughed. Only the finest would be acceptable. Wouldn't you agree, candy maker? August nearly swooned. He felt dizzy and lightheaded. He felt transported back in time to the Bethlehem stall. Such a strange bed for the Son of God. Such simple surroundings for the newborn Prince of Peace. Only the finest would be acceptable, August thought. Only the finest for the King of Kings. August awoke as if from a dream. He stared from the King to the figure of the baby Jesus. A humble baby King lying in a manger, surrounded not by gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but by the simple gifts of children. I said, wouldn't you agree, candy maker? The king repeated. Yes, August said. Only the finest would be acceptable for the king. August learned a special lesson that Christmas Eve. He learned that we all have a special gift which we can lay before the Christ child. It's not a gift that can be bought or wrapped or even be made by hand, the finest gift is to give completely of oneself, just as Jesus gave completely of himself for us. And what simpler way to remind ourselves of Jesus' gift than with August's Candy J, a pure stick of peppermint reminding us of the pure heart of Jesus, striped with red, as Jesus was striped with blood to set us free and curved into a shepherd's staff to remind us of our good shepherd, Jesus. But what, you may ask, ever happened to August? Well, 
From that day on, August opened the doors of his tiny shop to the children of Cologne. Prince James and the king himself came at least once a week. August welcomed every child to sample his wonderful wares, and he never again turned any of them away. August's Christmas canes were spread all over the country and to many countries beyond, reminding children everywhere of Jesus' love for us. August always remembered to give completely of himself to everyone he met and to give completely of himself to God, just as Jesus gave of himself for the whole world. And August wants you to always remember it too.